this week on Quadriga, nuclear power poker, straight to nowhere. North Korea carried out a third nuclear test this week, reaping widespread condemnation. Pyongyang remains unfazed, even thumbing its nose at China, its most important backer. Iran continues to build up its stockpile of enriched uranium in the face of fierce objections from the international community. Meanwhile, the US and Russia still possess the majority of the world's nuclear arsenal. Will we ever see a world free of nuclear weapons? Your host this week, Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. In a week that has seen the Pope resigning, it was North Korea that has dominated the headlines mostly. So what does this new nuclear test by Pyongyang mean for the global arms race? That's what we're going to talk about on today's show together with my three guests. Welcome to Gunther Knabe, who is DW's former diplomatic correspondent for Asia and the Islamic world. Michael Levitin is a U.S. journalist whose work appears in publications such as the International Herald Tribune and the LA Times. And Shayan Arkian is the editor-in-chief of Iran Unders, an online magazine on Iranian politics. Welcome to you all. Gunta Knabe, this test has elicited a great deal of global condemnation. Uh, President Obama referred to it in his State of the Union address, saying that North Korea is only further isolating itself with the conduct that is being displayed. Explain to us the rationale behind this act. I think it was definitely um, engineered or staged that uh, nuclear device explosion just to get attention for North Korea. One continuing line one can see in the North Korean policy, in particular nuclear policy, is to get attention as properly as they think they should get, mainly from the United States, because their aim is to sit at one table on the same level to be recognized by the United States and finally to get something like a official let's say, guarantee that the United States will no longer try what they think they are trying to do, to change the regime in North Korea. And what is the best shield, the best protection in their calculation than having a nuclear device or nuclear atomic bombs looking at Iraq, what happened to Saddam Hussein, looking to Libya, they say, look, the only protection we can get from that, that the United States might try to change our regime, our uh, government, is to show the world, and particularly to the United States, we have nuclear devices. Michael Levitin, is a nuclear test the best way to get Washington's attention? <laughs> uh, it's a certain way. Uh, it's been going on, though, for so long that it's hardly novel. It's hardly something new. Uh, and it's certainly not only America, the United States, that is waking up to the real dangers. I mean, they're sitting on the doorstep with South Korea and Japan, who are in, in, incredible allies of the United States. I think it's incredibly worrisome as well, obviously, to China, which I'm sure we'll discuss. I mean, it's 100 kilometers from the border with China where they blew this bomb off. Um, I think it's alarming to everyone. <clears throat> Clearly, America... Uh, is aware and it's been aware since since Bush made his axis of evil uh, of evil announcement ten years ago or so uh, that North Korea has been pushing this uh, envelope for some time um, and obviously getting involved in in other wars and fa Iraq and Afghanistan and failing to address this diplomatically over the last years um, has has had consequences and now with Obama's Asia pivot as they call it and uh, emphasis on Asia. Clearly, this is going to be one more area in which he's forced to engage. And explain seriously. to us, because you mentioned China. China's role here, obviously, is pivotal. Uh, Beijing, uh, usually one of the backers of the Pyongyang regime, um, voiced discontent. <clears throat> I mean, this is a real chance, I think, from America's perspective, for China to step up in a way that it hasn't uh, as a global, uh, play, a global strategic um, ally with major leading powers. I mean, it's constantly an obstructionist when it comes to international issues, from Iran to Syria to Libya to Sudan, wherever there's uh, almost a consensus that, you know, there needs to be action, uh, whether it's military, whether it's whatever, blocking a, a regime, China stands in the way. This is a situation in which they warned clearly, do not do this. There are 
deep ally and they won't stop being allies with North Korea, but they're going to have to step up and it looks already by the United Nations Security Council decision that they are helping take the lead on this and that's essential it seems. Cheyenne Arkian, what do you make of this move by Kim Jong-un? Um, I'm not an expert for North Korean, uh, North Korea affairs, but uh, I guess uh, it's uh, demonstration power uh, for, 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 for domestic reasons. And um, he's a young leader. He has to show uh, that uh, um, uh, he, has, he has a strong will. Because I think in the political culture of North Korea, to, to have to, to, to uh, legitimacy, you get their legitimacy through showing, through showing power. And uh, I think we have to uh, analyze it in, 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 the, in, this, in this context. I wouldn't agree uh, to that in the sense that you say he, he needs, uh, Kim Jong-un needs to prove that he is able to lead the country. I think the system, the political system, is so stable <clears throat> in North Korea. There is no danger for them or for Kim Jong-un to be toppled. There is nobody to do that or to try that. The system is a very um, closed one, and he's maybe not the only one who is uh, directing the policy in North Korea, but the military and the inner circle are very close, and there is no danger from, for him from inside North Korea. He doesn't have to prove he is a big leader for his own population. The NEV believe it in the very strict sense. They believe he is the big leader, and the dynasty is carried on in third generation. I think this uh, nuclear uh, maneuvers are only for foreign consumption or directed to the uh, neighboring countries and the world. However, to add to that, though, it does seem as though <clears throat> North Korea is simultaneously with the new leader, with Kim Jong-un, moving also toward, I don't know if it's an opening up in any real sense or if it's also a veneer, but this backdoor policy, the backdoor negotiations uh, of Google executives coming over with Bill Richardson, a high-level American mm -hmm. diplomat who negotiates on an international level to great success in the past. It's a curious development that just before this nuclear surprise, uh, uh, one of the major, you know, the major titan of the world in technology, Google, their highest executive, Eric Schmidt, comes over, sees what they're doing technologically, checks out their computer systems, <clears throat> and has a nice meeting that is, you know, backdoor. But it is a sign that something is occurring in the world of openness. Google yeah. represents internet, represents bringing the world to North Korea. So, so it's a curious. I consider that to be a parallel movement. First of all, showing strength by exploding nuclear devices, whatever quality that had and has. On the same, uh, at the same time, showing strength to the world and then being ready to have some negotiation and some opening, so very, very uh, yes. cautious opening, for the reason that they do know, of course, that if they go on economically, politically, the way they went up now, they are in danger that uh, really the system will break down economically, not politically, economically. And Michael Everton, would you say that the US strategy on, or rather vis-a-vis -vis North Korea has failed? Has failed. Oof. Or was there even a strategy to begin with? A strategy. I mean, so we. There was never a peace treaty, right? An actual formal peace treaty with North Korea was never signed. It was. It's still arm armistice. It was an armistice, it right? It is still so this war, armistice. the war that, that America fought, was never officially, finally concluded, in in a formal way, and it's been difficult relations for decades. I mean. Um, what, what is clear is that uh, on the 50th anniversary, which this year is the 50th anniversary of the uh, limited test ban treaty, the first ever nuclear treaty, which was signed in 1963 between the Soviet Union, states, and Britain, that this would be a moment to step forward and renew, and, and with North Korea and, of course, Iran as, as critical, uh, as an impulse to doing this, it would be a time to really step up.
diplomatic efforts. And indeed, Cheyenne Archeon, uh, this latest nuclear test by Pyongyang only adds to President Obama's headaches, if you will, on the foreign policy arena. Iran, obviously, has been on the forefront uh, for, for quite a number of years now. So Iran continues to enrich Iranian, but Tehran says solely for peaceful purposes. What do you make of this? Um, first of all, I think uh, the case of North Korea is completely different than the case of Iran. Uh, because uh, if we see the two hostile major countries of Iran, uh, United States and Israel, the intelligence, uh, the intelligence of both countries uh, admits that firstly, uh, Iran does not uh, uh, have uh, nuclear bombs. Secondly, Iran uh, has not decided to um, uh, develop nu uh, nuclear weapons. And thirdly, if Iran wants to build a nuclear bomb, uh, it takes uh, several years. Uh, so due, because of it, it is, uh, it is uh, it's not the same case. And, and, the ex uh, and North Korea is a very good example that shows that uh, po the policy of sanctions uh, uh, failed. Uh, North Korea is uh, supposedly, I think, um, the most isolated country uh, uh, in the world due to, due to, the, due to the sanctions. Uh, the, it has no productive uh, economy and uh, it, it, it doesn't work. The sanctions uh, do not work. And we'll talk more about the sanctions in yes. a bit. But isn't it true that Tehran, uh, over a number of years now, has been issuing direct and indirect threats towards Israel um, in, in, in the regard of of the bilateral relations. Um, there's a famous sentence from the president, uh, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, it, it, it's, it is quoted that he says that Israel should be wiped off the map. But I'm a Persian native speaker. I know uh, this, is, uh, uh, this, this, is, uh, this translation is not uh, correct. And even, and even uh, uh, he, he, it was not, not his words, uh, he, he, he quotes as a founder of the <laughs> republic. And if you see also the, the context, uh, it, uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot interpret it as a, as a, as a military suite. Uh, he, he says that the regime of Soviet Union passed, the regime of uh, South Africa passed, <coughs> and also the regime of uh, Israel uh, will be passed. So it was, the, the, the speak was about, uh, about uh, the political order in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. The official politic of, uh, of Iran regarding Israel is uh, to have a referendum. Uh, the Palestinians uh, uh, should uh, hold uh, a referendum. Uh, the Palestine in, 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 in Israel and also the Palestine in the other countries as refugees uh, should uh, vote uh, which uh, political order uh, they want. Uh, several months ago, the supreme leader of, of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, who was the uh, ultimate decision maker in, in security and foreign policy, uh, also repeated it and that says uh, Iran's policy is not uh, to uh, throw, throw the Jews uh, in the, in the uh, Mediterranean. So, uh, so, so are you convinced that the enriching of uranium on the part of Iran is for solely peaceful purposes. Is that your opinion? Um, according to NPT, Iran has an uh, ineligible right to uh, enrich uranium. And there are also uh, lawyers and specialists uh, in international law who say because of it, uh, the resolution against Iran uh, are illegal. Uh, but there's no, no international body who is above the Security Council, like in Germany, the Supreme Court, uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht, who says uh, this resolution is, is, is lawful or, or not, not, uh, not lawful, not legal. Um, Günther Knabe, you've yeah. been wanting yes. to jump in here. <laughs> right. Uh, I would like to, do, to add two remarks. First yes. of all, Ahmadinejad and whoever will he is, uh, be his follower in the next uh, presidential election, he is not the man to decide yes. whether Iran would drop a bomb or build a yes. bomb, an atomic bomb, for own purposes. Yes. He is not the man. Yes. Final decisions are always with the supreme leader, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, yes. and he obviously stopped the try to talk with the United States. So first of all, he is not the guy to decide. Secondly, um, why should Iran even be tempted if they would get an atomic bomb to drop that on Israel? Because they know very well that exactly it would be the extinction of Iran, more or less. So they are very well aware of that. Uh, I don't think that there is a danger of Iran, if they would ever get a nuclear bomb, to really apply it, in particular not against Israel. But I doubt whether they are not striving to get hands off on, not off, on an atomic bomb. What you did not mention is 
that certain uh, devices and productive or production uh, installations and sites in Iran are not accessible for to the uh, uh, International Iranian uh, International Atomic Energy Commission. This is what Iran has to deliver still. Yes, uh, there are also, uh, yesterday uh, Mr. Nekats was in Iran to, to discuss this matter. Um, uh, but these sites, uh, which, which you say, is, this is, these are not uh, nuclear facilities. These are uh, military facilities, uh, for example, Parchin. And Parchin, according to NPT, uh, the IAEA, has mm. no right to, to inspect. Uh, so if Iran uh, gives the permission, permission mm. to, to inspect, uh, uh, it's, it do a act, uh, it's doing an act uh, which is beyond its, mm. its uh, obligation. And Iran once uh, once have uh, a framework uh, of, of uh, a set of uh, law, of, uh, a modality that uh, if they go there, if they don't find anything, then the case can be closed. Because in the past, uh, the IAEA second t uh, two times mm. uh, visited and inspected mm. uh, Parchin, and, uh, and 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 that time <coughs> the deputy of the safeguard for Iran says Parchin uh, is uh, is history. It's it's mm. a part mm. of history. But now, after uh, the U director Amano. Many cases which was solved in the past uh, are now again on the agenda, and because of it, Iran uh, wants to ensure that uh, if they give this permission, that uh, that this uh, file can be closed. Michael Levitin, we've been talking about North Korea now. We've been talking about Iran, but there's another country. Many people are saying that is not uh, being paid much attention to, unjustified so, namely Pakistan. Many people are saying that North Korea is an unstable country. Iran is somewhat volatile, but Pakistan is no less volatile. Isn't that the case? And it has nuclear weapons. Absolutely, and <clears throat> I believe that the model that Pakistan succeeded in order to get nuclear weapons is essentially what Iran and North Korea, I suppose, are, are, are gambling on. The, basically, the idea that if you hold out long enough and you basically play a cat-mouse game, you let, you let specters in a bit, you go to diplomatic you know, relations, and then you fend off, and you have uh, <laughs> mutual aggression and get out of our, our uh, land. Um, attitude, which is basically uh, Iran's been playing this for years now, I mean years. And the international community is, is at this point, doesn't have much choice. I mean, under the Bush years, Bush chose to go with the hawks of Washington mm -hmm. to invade Iraq, the arch enemy of Iran that was helping contain Iran's power, and over these last seven, eight, nine years, basically watched the, the march of the nuclear, uh, nuclear developments in Iran take place. So b Pakistan's ability to get nuclear weapons, the West did not take its moment to halt that. India was not able to halt it, and now it has it, and that's it. And Iran, essentially, I think we can all do all the talking we want, and they're going to have meetings in Kazakhstan later this month, and they're willing to meet after eight-month hiatus. But basically, what are you going to do at this point? It seems to be, uh, if you want to talk realpolitik, uh, most realistic, like Pakistan. They held off long enough. They played the diplomatic game, um, kind of playing chicken, in a way. And it would be interesting to see what response the West really could uh, bring to Iran, other than the hard sanctions which they brought, which has really brought the country to its knees, in a sense, economically. Concerning Pakistan, one should not forget that during those years when Dr. Khan, who was the big atomic scientist of uh, uh, Pakistan. During those years, Pakistan was a very close ally of the United States. Due to Afghanistan war, they needed, the Americans needed Pakistan to fight Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. So there was a completely different political scenery at that time. And I think there is one means anyway, if there is one uh, in the hands of the West, to try to stop Iran, for example, and also to some extent North Korea, but mainly Iran, those are economic sanctions. I think this was rather effectively applied to Iran. Now, the uh, inflation is going up, uh, Iran uh, currency is going down, oil exports are dwindling down 40%. And this is something that hits the uh, government, the regime in Iran quite a bit, so that is a certain level to let's say, uh, bring the Iranians to the table of uh, deliberations. And therefore, I uh, would say, they said, yes, we will meet for 
continuation of our uh, deliberations in Kazakhstan. So whom would you deem to be a greater threat here, Iran or Pakistan? I had, meant to, I had meant to conclude by saying that I do feel that Pakistan, clearly, with its unstable political situation in the long term, I would see Pakistan equally or more so as a threat with nuclear weapons. I mean, given that nobody really knows what... Threat for whom? To everyone, to India for starters, and of to, course India. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but I mean, Islamic. You you let we talk about you know the capability of of, of Islamic of, of fundamentalist oriented people giving weapons or technology elsewhere. It's a great. There's threat. also an aspect in in in, in this affairs about uh, nuclear bomb in Pakistan, which is uh, discussed very less in West. Uh, it is that uh, the Saudi Arabia financed uh, this nuclear bomb. Which interests have Saudi Arabia to finance the uh, nuclear bomb in Pakistan? Uh, in Iran, there is uh, the fear that uh, uh, maybe uh, one day uh, Pakistan can uh, deliver this uh, nuclear bomb to Saudi Arabia if, if it's necessary. But uh, um, regarding the Iranian nuclear uh, dossier, I think uh, th this can be solved uh, in, in weeks. Uh, uh, the, the rest uh, must have to accept uh, and which uh, must have uh, must accept uh, the right of en enrichment in Iran and the US have to accept uh, the uh, Islamic Republic uh, uh, as a legitimate order in Iran then uh, ne negotiation between between US and Iran uh, ca uh, can be uh, conducted uh, very easier and this was the remarks of uh, the supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei four, four or five days mm -hmm. ago uh, in essence, uh, he he, uh, he mentioned exactly the same as the Iranian foreign minister as he was in here in Berlin and uh, Munich. If you compare the two speeches, both say the same uh, that uh, we we are not uh, categorically uh, uh, and uh, not in principle against against negotiation, negotiation with Iran, but we want uh, uh, negotiation for solving the, uh, uh, the the problems, not negotiation for negotiation. This this is also the, the remarks. No, but uh, Iran of, tends to say we don't want any threats coming to us if we're to negotiate. Mm -hmm. The reason we're developing mm -hmm. these weapons is because we feel threatened and insecure. The same argument that North Korea, in a sense, like don't threaten us, that's why we're developing these weapons, that's not a very legitimate argument to bring people to the table um, to say, take away the stick, just the carrot, please. So there's a mistrust between the United States and Iran. If you, if you look at the policy of, of uh, Nixon, Kissinger, uh, what they uh, do uh, as, as immediately after he uh, becomes president, uh, he, he stops uh, activities against China, and, and this uh, creates a trust uh, in China. I think we have to do the same politics with Iran uh, to, to stop the activities, uh, 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 for example, the cyber war, for example, uh, killing uh, nuclear scientists in Iran. Uh, uh, this is not trustful. <laughs> in the uh, the deeply ingrained mistrust, distrust of the Iranians towards the Americans applies to far than a far an extent also to North Korea, and to some extent, seen from their point of view, the Iranians and the North Koreans, one can to some extent understand. I think what the United States has to try very seriously to overcome this gap that they give assurance to some extent to the North Korean regime and to Tehran that, look, we are ready to take you serious and we no longer will threat you by trying to change the regime. They wouldn't be able to do it, and they have to show that they don't want to do it. Back to Pakistan, what is the bigger threat, North Korea or Pakistan? I wouldn't consider Pakistan a real threat the, concerning that maybe the nuclear devices would fall into terrorist hands. Pakistan has two, uh, has one major force, political force and military is one. If Pakistan, which is tottering from one crisis to another, since it's very coming into existence, whenever there was a real deep crisis in Pakistan, military stepped in. And I'm convinced that the military will always step in, in case Pakistan is on the verge to become a Islamic, uh, extreme Islamic country, and Islamic terrorists in Pakistan might be on the verge to get hold on of the atomic weapons of Pakistan. As I think there is no real danger. Military will still be there to stop that and to prevent that. Does the Pakistan military does not help the, the Taliban uh, even till several years ago? So is, is there not a, a strong connection between the the military and the, and the extremists? Yes, to some extent, right. Okay. I agree, particularly with concern uh, their actions in Afghanistan and against the uh, Afghan uh, forces. That's right. 
Bin but, Laden was in Pakistan, <laughs> for example. Right, but that's the difference between yes. using the Taliban and yes. other Islam terrorists for the purposes concerning Afghanistan's interest in uh, Pakistan's interest in Afghanistan, and being aware that terrorists never should get hold their hands on atomic nuclear devices. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, it seems as though there's also a good cop, bad cop thing happening with mm. Iran right now. I, I pick up, I mean, now Ahmadinejad, who never really has uh, a welcoming word to the West, says, yeah, sure, now that he's in the waning months of his term, I'm ready to, let, let's talk, let's have bilateral negotiations. <clears throat> now, and Khamenei, of course, comes out, Ayatollah, Khamenei in complete rejection. I mean, as of a couple of days ago, he uh, basically it, said, it, "Not this is a unless you Western society, misconception, I, I Western, but that's uh, the global new, that's, that's, yes, that's I, I read the full speech. It's it's in, in principle, it, it, it says exactly the same like Ahmadinejad and Foreign Minister, but in a clerical words and rhetoric. And this is a, a great problem in Western uh, media. Uh, they have uh, not the deep uh, knowledge of, of of this religious society to to and the clerical uh, rhetorics to." understand what this is point. Uh, uh, he says uh, if, 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 if uh, this is uh, really what, what, is, what he also says in the same speech that uh, if uh, the United States stop, uh, stop to uh, sweeting us, the negotiation can, can take place. Stops. To threat, uh, threaten us. Threaten, yes, well, that's yes. not very realistic. But it's the same. Unfortunately, same, same it's not. Mr. Sali says, and, and also it's also uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad. And interesting is uh, <laughs> uh, the offer of uh, Joe Biden uh, uh, for for Iran. I, I I did not see it uh, as uh, as the offer for uh, direct negotiation because he also makes a condition. He says uh, we are we are open for 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 uh, bilateral uh, uh, negotiation if if Iran is serious. <laughs> and Iran says we are also ready if if USA yeah. is serious. If your argument is correct, and yeah. it might be, isn't then it very certain that Iran will still strive for a nuclear bomb just out of those reasons yeah. of distrust and being insecure about the uh, schemes and policies of the United States? I've got the strong feeling that the Iranians in general are pro an atomic bomb in the hands of Iranian politicians or of Iran. And I would guess that even Iranians in exile would be kind of proud, be kind of proud if Iran has a nuclear bomb. I think uh, in this case, uh, the religious uh, um, uh, government in, in Iran is a better partner for us than the exiled Iranian in 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 in, in, uh, in, yeah. in the diaspora because uh, Iran is a religious state. It uh, constitutes itself as re religiously, and the Supreme Leader issued several years ago a fatwa, a, a, a school, a, a religious uh, uh, verdict that forbids uh, a nuclear weapon to to have to build uh, and and to uh, to 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 buy, buy nuclear weapons and uh, over and over Iranian officials uh, uh, repeated and we should uh, take it seriously for Iranians and for the Iranian government. Uh, a religious rhetoric uh, is much more binding than, than secular law like NPT or, or, or international laws. And Shayan Arkham, would you say that we've been talking about Iran Iranian politics, Iranian politicians up until now. What about the people, people on the street in Iran? Do they uh, support these aspirations, if you will? Um, s uh, some days ago, uh, uh, Gallup Institute uh, uh, con uh, performed a survey in Iran uh, and asked the people uh, about the sanctions if, if, if it's uh, hurt uh, the Iranians. Uh, uh, almost half of, of them said yes, uh, it, it uh, hurts them uh, presently, the, the livelihood. But uh, at the same time, they blame the U.S. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, uh, only 8% uh, blame their own government. So in this sense, you see also th that sanctions uh, uh, does not work. It, it creates uh, exactly the, <coughs> the uh, opposite results uh, which we uh, which we uh, which. And indeed, do sanctions work? That is an imminent and critical question in this debate about nuclear arms. Many, many countries have been imposed uh, sanctions on with mixed reviews. Let's have a look. The United Nations is weighing tough new sanctions against North Korea following its latest nuclear test. The isolated nation is already hurting badly, but it's the ordinary people who are suffering, hit by chronic malnutrition and even starvation. The country's new leader remains defiant. 
In Iran, too, sanctions are biting. Its vital oil revenues are shrinking due to export restrictions and inflation is rife. The West and Iran have been at loggerheads over its nuclear program for years. The UN first imposed sanctions in 2006, outlawing the supply of nuclear-related materials and technology to Tehran. Over the years, the US and the EU have ratcheted up the economic pressure. Yet the power of the Ayatollahs and their revolutionary guards appears undiminished. There are even fears that sanctions could be backfiring. So why does the international community keep imposing them? And what are the possible alternatives? Well, Gunta Knabe, we just saw sanctions, double-edged sword, no? That's different. First of all, sanctions normally hit the people of the different countries against the sanctions are applied. This is to be sure. and doesn't hit that much the regimes. But if sanctions are applied in a way that the policies of a certain government are interfered with or impeded, then they work. One example is Iran, when what we mentioned before, the, uh, the United States and the Western countries applying sanctions to the extent that oil exports, which is the major revenue of Iran, of Iran, were diminished, when by that economic situation is really getting worse and difficult in a country like Iran, and the regime has to be afraid that the population then might get restive then it works to only to some extent. You mentioned before that the majority of people in Iran would, I think, and I hope you will agree, they would say we go hungry better than be slaves of the Americans. Yes. <clears throat> and much more it applies to uh, North Korea. They will go <coughs> hungry, they will starve if the regime says we have to be independent. One thing is very impressive in a way. If you encounter North Koreans, they have one thing in their mind. We'll never be colonized by anybody. They were colonized by the Japanese, which is not forgotten, neither in the South nor in the, uh, in the North, and they will never agree to anything that what they feel to be something like repetition of being colonized or bossed around by any other country. So what you're saying then is sanctions won't work. Not at all. In that case. Korea. They didn't work and they won't work. The ironic is uh, the greatest uh, victim of the sanction, Iran, uh uh, uh, such is, uh, is the layer of the, is the middle class, and uh, in, in this sense, it's the democratization of, of Iran because uh, uh, only uh, through the middle class you, you can have a uh, um, uh, pressure for, for, for uh, uh, democracy. And, and exactly <coughs> this uh, middle class, uh, or, or better to say, uh, uh, the sectors of societies uh, of, the, of the society in Iran who are the most pro Western uh, uh, are now the victims of Western uh, mm -hmm. sanctions. Michael Everton, uh, Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, these are usually the countries that we're referring to in this debate about the nuclear arms race. But it's really the U.S. and Russia, no, that still have the most uh, pile, if you will, of, of nuclear arms in their possessions. President Obama made a statement saying that he wants to disarm much quicker now. Um, what do you make of this? At the end of the day, these two countries are still in possession of lot of nuclear weapons. 90 to 95 percent, they say, yeah, the global stockpile is in their hands. I think clearly um, we have to make a connection between trying to encourage as diplomatically as possible Iran, North Korea, come to the table to have some measure of discussions, not to build nuclear weapons, but if you're going to do that as the United States, you have to simultaneously show that you, in good faith you are diminishing your your, your decades-long stockpile that, you know, threatened to blow the world up only decades ago, uh, you need to show in, in faith. Um, obviously, you know, <clears throat> George Bush did a major in 2002. He, he withdrew America from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, right? Our Senate failed to ratify, and America did not ratify the Comprehensive Nuclear Best Test Ban Treaty in 99, I believe. That's just sat there for 12 or 13 years now. So this is a moment, and as I say, there's a 50th anniversary of the limited test ban treaty. This is a moment where Obama, I think, sees 
the the ability whether Putin in Russia is a negotiable partner or not in this, who knows? I think America, I think Obama is determined to lead on this whether Putin comes forward necessarily right now or not. Mm -hmm. um, this reset of relations under Hillary Clinton with, with and, and Obama with Russia was really it was an important step forward in, in the broader uh, sense of getting the countries back in step in line. And if this new start uh, ban, the, the strategic um, nuclear uh, arms treaty start, if that would take effect, it would limit our stockpiles by a third. And that would be something significant, I think, by 2018. But they could move it up before 2018 if they get these negotiations underway. And that would do a huge service, I think, to proceeding with negotiations <clears throat> against countries that are threatening to develop weapons. Uh, I feel the greatest danger for the for the non profit uh, approach like NPT is uh, uh, such kind of double standard, but also um, uh, it shows uh, <coughs> if you are part of the Western Bloc, uh, so you have uh, no fear, uh, you, you, are not, you have no fear of consequences. For example, South Korea uh, secretly in the past uh, enriched uranium up to 77 percent without any consequence. Uh, even the agency did not uh, uh, rebuke it. I agree that the importance of NPT really applying it would give much more weight to any demands from nuclear powers to other countries of other countries to stop going after nuclear devices. There's a lot of hypocrisy. These five signature uh, powers, which were at that time possessing nuclear arms, they are to me, something like a club of alcoholics who say, look, never do that. That's a very bad stuff. And then pros it, don't do it. <laughs> yeah? So this is a lot of hypocrisy. If they would start to really diminish the nuclear devices they have at hand, and it's a huge stockpile, even if Obama says, I'll diminish it by, let's say, 7,000, still 10,000 devices are there, and it doesn't might be enough to destroy the world, more or less. So a prerogative for any real chances to have a certain uh, level of disarmament nuclear-wise would be that these powers really reduce their nuclear arms by a substantial, at least substantial number. Um, Michael Everton, would you say that it is unrealistic. We've had the question in the beginning of the show, is a world without nuclear weapons possible? Considering all what we've heard uh, today, what would you say? How realistic Look, is it? In the eyes of the president that we currently have, who went to Prague after his election in one of his signature speeches, along with his speech in, in Egypt, speaking to the Arabic world, he went to Prague to speak to the world about war. And his vision is that in some day in the future, the, the ideal is that we would live in a world that we can't all blow each other up in at the push of a button. And I think that's been the, the ideal ever since we saw uh, in the Cold War. But is it wishful thinking? Of course, at the moment, given, given, given the status of geopolitical, uh, confrontational, uh, short-sighted politics where every country is looking at the next election and global finance is controlling essentially the whole political game, uh, so you're saying peace, we, world peace is still a ways off. But so you're <laughs> saying we have to get used to the facts. I'm saying that I think that I agree with Gunter that obviously moving forward in the way Obama uh, is attempting to do is the only way you can do it. It's the, the drinker is trying to stop drinking. Yes. And right. um, okay, and try to prevent future alcoholics, and he's also trying to give it up. So um, that's the only way you but can go there forward. There's the school or the institution to get those uh, uh, nuclear drinkers off the stuff. I think it's a vision to have a uh, world without nuclear weapons. I doubt this will ever become reality. On the contrary, coming back to North Korea's uh, exploding nuclear devices, this is opening another box of Pandora because the neighbors like South Korea, Japan, will be tempted to say, look, if they have got atomic nuclear devices, we need that too. And it goes on that way. But this also one last thing about China, that this is a key moment, this whole yep. North Korea issue. China is a huge player in terms of our global climate yep. situation. America and China must come to a new relationship, right? So, Gunther Knab, if I understand it correctly, China we'll must. see more nuclear weapons rather than less in the future. I'm afraid, yes. 
Um, what can we do? Maybe uh, it's not possible uh, to, to uh, disarm nuclear disarmament worldwide, but what we can do is uh, uh, for, for special regions uh, to declare a nuclear free zone like the Middle East and things. The Middle East has uh, much need uh, for it. And uh, uh, one month, two months ago, there, there, there was a, a planned a conference in, 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 in Finland, which was, which was unfortunately cancelled. And uh, so this uh, about about nuclear free zone, um, uh, nuclear weapons free zone in in in, uh, uh, in Middle East, and the Iranians interestingly are ready to to participate and they declare uh, the patriot, but it was Israel who has not uh, 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 want to to patriate in, in in such a project. Will Iran, you think, express anything different about Israel, or will it persist in in essentially its denial of the right to exist as a state? Yes, but uh, it's, it's the same. It's the same. Uh, it's the same like uh, Iran uh, ex uh, denied the existing of the apartheid in South Africa. Th this denying of the existence of, of, of Israel does not mean that uh, it's must be, uh, it must be uh, uh, reached uh, through, through uh, uh, military attacks mm -hmm. uh, through, uh, through uh, uh, like, like Soviet Union. I said the, the, the speech of Mr. Amanejad about uh, uh, which was uh, mistranslated in wipe of the map uh, was was uh, was uh, he offered a, a political solution, not not uh, not a military solution, and. Um, Often, often we have uh, the discussion if it comes to Israel that uh, these uh, parties do not uh, accept uh, the existence of Israel, but uh, uh, never, it is never asked why Israel do not accept uh, the, the existence of Pal Palestine state. Well, one thing's for certain, and I think this discussion has shown it today. I think uh, whether we can rid the world of nuclear arms anytime soon, we'll have to see. But it looks increasingly doubtful, judging from today's discussion anyway. I want to thank my guests for, for sharing their insights into this uh, latest discussion. I want to thank you out there for tuning in. And looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quadriga.